Hey, future doctors. Thanks for joining me on Spoonful of Sugar, a podcast made for medical students by medical students to help the medicine go down. My name is Rhea Mulherker. I'm a student at Drexel University College of Medicine, and I will be your host today. All right, nerds. Today, we're going to talk about ARDS and NRDS, adult and neonatal respiratory distress syndromes. These are two totally unrelated processes that just happen to lead to similar chest x-ray findings and, of course, happen to have very similar names. And so we're going to talk about them in conjunction. If you're studying for Step 1, you've probably realized by now that questions on these board exams are never as straightforward as you'd like. It's always going to be a second or third order question that requires you to understand what is going on in a complicated vignette to be able to answer the question. And a lot of times when you're going through a test, you might not know for sure what's going on, and so it becomes sort of a guessing game. I found this to be especially true with ARDS and NRDS, and when I was taking practice questions, I often struggled to understand what the underlying disease process was. And so today, what I really want to focus on is understanding how these diseases happen and then how they're going to present in a vignette so that you can start to understand how to better attack these complicated second and third order questions. For these two conditions, we're just going to divide and conquer. So let's start with neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. It makes sense chronologically, and there's also a lot more you have to know about it, I think. And so we'll get the hard one out of the way first. Okay. So to understand NRDS, I think what you really have to understand is what surfactant does. So let me ask you, What is surfactant? What does it do? So surfactant is this mix of lipoproteins that works to decrease alveolar surface tension and prevent alveolar collapse. So by doing that, it actually decreases the tendency of the lung to recoil and it increases lung compliance. Okay, and that's a lot, so we're going to break that down. First of all, what is surfactant made of exactly? So I did say lipoproteins, and it is made up of certain lipoproteins, but some specific names you have to recognize are sphingomyelins and lecithins. Okay, these are fats. The most important lecithin you have to know is called dipalmitoylphosphatidylcholine, or DPPC. DPPC um, is the most important lecithin that composes surfactant, so you should be familiar with some of those names. And then functionally, we said it decreases surface tension, right? And then it decreases the tendency of the lung to collapse. So the way that we can understand this is by using a particular equation that tells us about the collapsing pressure. Do you guys know what equation I'm thinking about? The equation is collapsing pressure equals two times surface tension divided by radius. I'll say it one more time. Collapsing pressure equals two times the surface tension divided by the radius, or 2t over r, okay? So this helps us understand what surfactant does, because if surfactant decreases the surface tension, and that's in the numerator, when we decrease tension, we'll also decrease the collapsing pressure. So surfactant makes the lung less likely to collapse. What about the radius? Are they going to ask you questions about that? You bet. So if the radius of the alveoli decreases, what's going to happen to the collapsing pressure? We'll think about that equation. 2t over r, radius is in the denominator. So if radius decreases, collapsing pressure is actually going to increase, right? More tendency of the lung to collapse. And they're not just going to straight up ask you what happens if the radius decreases. They're either going to show you a picture or they can ask you what happens during the respiratory cycle. So if we translate this to breathing in and out, when are alveoli going to have more of a tendency to collapse? When you're inspiring or expiring? So another way of asking the same question is, when is the radius of the alveoli going to be smaller? Probably when you're expiring, right, and getting out that air, that's when the radius decreases, the collapsing pressure increases, and so alveoli have more of a tendency to collapse on expiration. I think this makes sense if you think about it. 
but the equation helps to kind of solidify that understanding. And if you have that part down, understanding how surfactant works, I think that's really the hardest part. And the rest of it is just sort of trivia. So some other things you need to know about surfactant. What type of cells secrete surfactant? Type 2 pneumocytes, okay? These are cuboidal cells. Do you remember what type 1 pneumocytes are? So type 1 pneumocytes are squamous cells, and these are the cells that are thin, and they, that's why they line the alveoli for gas exchange, okay? Type 2 pneumocytes are these cuboidal cells that actually secrete surfactant. And do you remember what special organelle that they have that holds the surfactant? It's called lamellar bodies, okay? So if there is damage to the lung, which type of cell would proliferate in response to that damage? One or two? Type 2. Type 2 pneumocytes are special because they can actually proliferate and then they can either differentiate into type 1 or more type 2 pneumocytes, okay? So if they're ever asking you about lung damage, type 2 pneumocytes are going to be the cells responsible for repairing that damage. Now, if you think back to your embryology and normal lung development, when do type 2 pneumocytes start secreting surfactant? Around 25 weeks. Um, around 20 weeks is when the pneumocytes themselves start to develop, and then 25 weeks is when you start secreting surfactant. Now, over time, as a fetus develops, there's an increase in the amount of surfactant that's secreted, and then there's also a change in the composition of the surfactant. Do you guys know around what gestational age the lungs are generally considered mature? Usually around 35 weeks of gestational age, the lungs have secreted enough surfactant that a baby can be born and breathe healthily on its own. And how do we tell if the lungs are mature? Just to give you an example, um, there's lots of reasons that a baby might be born prematurely. We might sample the amniotic fluid and measure a specific value to determine if the lungs are mature or if we need to help them out a little. So one screening test is the lecithin to sphingomyelin ratio, okay? And that is measured from the amniotic fluid. Do you guys know what a good ratio is? What ratio indicates that this baby's lungs are healthy? Over two, okay? If the lecithin to sphingomyelin ratio is over two, then that indicates that the baby can probably breathe on its own. If the ratio is less than 1.5 though, it's probably a risk for neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, okay? And just to give you an idea of the timeline, usually around 30 weeks, the lecithin to sphingomyelin ratio starts increasing rapidly, and generally around 35 weeks, the lungs are mature, so that lecithin sphingomyelin ratio reaches 2. Aside from that ratio, though, there's another method of testing if the lungs are mature. So what if they describe adding increasing amounts of ethanol to a fixed volume of amniotic fluid and then shaking that mixture and looking for a continuous line of bubbles on top? Do you guys know what test I just described? This is something called the foam stability index, okay? And it basically uses alcohol, which is an anti-foaming agent, and it measures if there's enough surfactant. So surfactant allows the foam bubbles to form even if there is some alcohol. Um, and if there's not enough surfactant, then alcohol will kind of break that continuous line of bubbles. So that's called the foam stability index. Now, that was a lot of buildup, but I think I'm finally ready to talk about the actual disease, NRDS, okay? So let me start by describing a case, and then we'll kind of dissect it a little further. So the case is this. A male infant is born by C-section at 32 weeks gestational age to a 26-year-old woman who has maternal diabetes. In the first few hours of life, he starts developing dyspnea, and he shows nasal flaring, intercostal retractions, and expiratory grunting. He's hypoxemic, and he's not responding to 100% oxygen. A chest x-ray shows bilateral diffuse ground glass opacities. All right, that's the case. Let's dissect it a little. So this child obviously has neonatal respiratory distress syndrome, right? Um, 
what are his risk factors for NRDS? So he's 32 weeks, right? So he's premature. So his surfactant probably isn't enough and his lungs are not mature. What are other risk factors for NRDS besides prematurity? Maternal diabetes is definitely one. Do you guys know why that is? So maternal diabetes is usually treated with insulin, but insulin can cross the placenta, okay, and it can actually impede surfactant synthesis. So the prematurity, the maternal diabetes. Do you guys know what third risk factor this child has for NRDS? His mode of birth. So he was born by C-section, right? And why does C-section increase risk of NRDS? So C-section results in decreased release of glucocorticoids by the mom as compared to a vaginal delivery. And glucocorticoids can actually stimulate surfactant synthesis. So if a child is born by C-section, then there's less glucocorticoids and less surfactant synthesis, okay? So just to kind of summarize, his risk factors are prematurity, maternal diabetes, and then the C-section delivery. Now, let's talk about some of his physical findings, okay? They clearly indicate that he's struggling to breathe. The nasal flaring, the intercostal retractions, the expiratory grunting. Why isn't he responding to 100% oxygen, though? So if you remember how the lungs work, Anytime there's decreased oxygen in the lungs, we create a shunt, right? The blood ends up flowing to parts of the lungs that are better oxygenated. And that works well usually until the entire lung is getting poor oxygenation, okay? Then what happens is you get a right-to-left shunt because you're not ventilating well and you're not perfusing well either. So in these patients, it's usually okay to give them some oxygen, but you really have to be careful, do you guys know what some of the complications of oxygen therapy are in the context of NRDS? So a big one is called retinopathy of prematurity. And that happens because oxygen causes secretion of free radicals, and those damage the retina directly. And then whenever the O2 is actually removed, you can have an excess compensatory proliferation of blood vessels, and that can cause blindness, okay? Free radicals can also directly cause damage to the lungs, and what complication would that result in? Something called bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and then we can also get a third complication in the brain. Do you know what that is? interventricular hemorrhage, okay? And why does that happen? So the germinal matrix, which is where precursor glial cells proliferate, is actually very vascular. And so it can, uh, you can get more vascular proliferation in that area because of the hypoxia, and that can precipitate bleeding, okay? And then a final complication of NRDS the PDA, which was supposed to close, um, normally closes because of increased oxygen tension. It often doesn't close in these patients because of their hypoxia, and so that shunt remains open. Now, his chest x-ray finding that we talked about, he had the ground glass opacities. Do you guys know why he had those? So... In NRDS, the ground glass opacities actually result from the fact that there is diffuse atelectasis, okay? Alveoli are collapsing everywhere, and so we get increased density on both sides of the chest x-ray, okay? And it leads to that granular appearance, which is described as having a ground glass appearance. Another finding you might see on chest x-ray is something called air bronchograms, okay? So this, all the small airways are filled with air, and usually you can't see them that well because the alveoli are open. But now when they close, there's more tissue density around them, and so you see these air bronchograms, okay? Now, how do we treat NRDS? If you're thinking steroids, that is generally effective before the infant is born, okay? So we can give the mom dexamethasone sometimes if she's at risk for a premature delivery to help stimulate surfactant synthesis.
But once the child is born and they're struggling from NRDS, what do we give them? So we have to intubate these patients, and we can try giving them oxygen via CPAP. You do have to be careful to watch out for those complications. But the other thing we can give them is exogenous surfactant through that tube as well. So before birth, you try to prevent NRDS by maximizing steroids. After birth, though, you can give them exogenous surfactant, and then you have to treat them supportively. I do want to mention one condition that also leads to respiratory distress in a newborn, and I want to mention it just so you don't confuse it with NRDS. So in this case, let's say a neonate is delivered by C-section, and he's tachypnic, meaning that he has over 60 breaths per minute. Remember, vitals are different in babies. Uh, he's also showing that increased work, work of breathing. He has the nasal flaring, intercostal retractions. But his chest x-ray shows bilateral perihilar linear streaking. What's the diagnosis here? So if you were thinking NRDS, the chest x-ray findings are different, right? The bilateral perihilar linear streaking, that corresponds to a disease called transient tachypnea of the newborn. And this disease results because there's excess lung fluid that's residual in the infant's lungs. And usually during vaginal delivery, it kind of gets squeezed out of the lungs. But in the C-section, that doesn't happen. And then all the fluid in the lungs kind of moves to the interstitium. And that's why you get that perihilar linear streaking. Okay. So you can differentiate NRDS versus transient tachypnea of the newborn based on the chest x-ray findings. I just wanted to mention that so you don't confuse the two. Let's move on now to adults. So I'm going to describe another case for you here. A 45-year-old man with a history of alcoholism is admitted for severe epigastric pain that radiates to his back. It's associated with nausea and vomiting. He's admitted to the hospital, treated with appropriate analgesics. He's kept NPO. He's given a nasogastric tube. And about 48 hours into his admission, he starts developing tachycardia, tachypnea, dyspnea, increased work of breathing, his oxygen saturation is 85%, and on lung auscultation, you can hear diffuse crackles bilaterally. So he's intubated, started on mechanical ventilation. His diagnosis, so adult respiratory distress syndrome. And why did he get ARDS? What was his original problem? The epigastric pain radiating to the back, that's classic for pancreatitis, okay? Especially given that history of alcoholism. And so why does his pancreatitis lead to ARDS? What causes ARDS? ARDS happens in the setting of any alveolar insult, right? The most common cause is sepsis. It can happen in the setting of trauma. Pancreatitis is also a common precipitating factor. So... What happens after that alveolar insult? Basically, you get a massive release of cytokines, and then this leads to activation of neutrophils, recruitment of other cytotoxic enzymes, and it basically creates endothelial damage that causes leakage of protein-rich exudate into the alveoli. And all those proteins that leak into the alveoli can actually form what's called a hyaline membrane along the alveolar membrane. And so you might hear the term hyaline membrane disease being used as a synonym for ARDS. Now, all of this, which I just described, all the fluid leaking out into the alveoli because of cytotoxic damage, that is known as the first phase of ARDS, the exudative phase, when you get an exudate in the alveoli. This is the first out of three phases. So do you guys know what the second phase of ARDS is? This is going to be the proliferative phase. So in response to all that damage, you get a lot of endothelial cells, pneumocytes, fibroblasts, all starting to proliferate and try and heal some of that damage. This is when collagen gets deposited and edema starts getting resorbed. Now, what's the third and final phase of ARDS? This is the fibrotic phase, and it actually doesn't happen in everyone, but a minority of patients who have ARDS can get pulmonary fibrosis and even pulmonary hypertension from excessive collagen deposition. So basically, if the second healing phase kind of gets out of control, then you get fibrosis. 
And so the phases of ARDS are exudative, proliferative, and then fibrotic. Now, if you've been paying attention, you realize that ARDS results in pulmonary edema. Can you guys think of another situation when there'd be pulmonary edema from fluid leaking into the alveoli? If you're thinking about CHF, or congestive heart failure, you're absolutely right. Because in congestive heart failure, if it's left-sided, you can get a backup of blood in the pulmonary vessels, and all that blood can start leaking into the alveoli, creating pulmonary edema. So how do we differentiate non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, as in ARDS, versus cardiogenic pulmonary edema, as in congestive heart failure? So we use a measure called pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, or PCWP. What would PCWP be in ARDS? It should be normal because there's no backup of blood from the heart, and so there's no increased pressure in the pulmonary vasculature, okay? There's edema because of a different cause, which is alveolar damage. Now, what is PCWP in CHF? You can bet that it's increased because this time the left heart is failing and so there is a backup of pressure in the pulmonary vasculature, okay? So just remember that ARDS is a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema and it's associated with a normal PCWP. So how do we actually diagnose ARDS in a patient? Clinically, it can be a little tricky, and it's actually a diagnosis of exclusion, okay? One important thing to note is that the respiratory failure generally begins usually after one to two days of the insult, and so that's why in our case, the patient got pancreatitis, and then two days later, he went into ARDS. We can also use the chest x-ray. It has that ground glass appearance. It's also sometimes described as a bilateral whiteout appearance. And this time, the ground glass opacities are from diffuse alveolar infiltrate, okay? Remember in NRDS, they were from the atelectasis or the collapsing of the lungs. In ARDS, they're from actual alveolar edema. Another way to diagnose that we just talked about is ruling out cardiac causes of fluid overload. So remember, we use PCWP, and it should be normal to make sure that this is a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And then finally, there's a measure that we can use. We can take the ratio of PaO2 to FiO2. So the oxygen in the pulmonary artery to the fraction of inspired oxygen. And that ratio should be less than 300. It should be decreased. And do you guys know why? It's because ARDS is a state of hypoxemia, right? You're not ventilating well, and so there's intrapulmonary shunting, and then the hyaline membranes forming along the alveoli impair diffusion. As a result, the concentration of oxygen in the pulmonary artery is decreased compared to normal, and that PaO2 to FiO2 ratio drops below 300. Now, how do we treat ARDS? So we actually don't have a great answer, okay? The treatment of ARDS is mainly supportive. So these patients generally go to the ICU and they're started on mechanical ventilation with positive end expiratory pressure, okay? So we just hope that they'll get better on their own. And in the meantime, we just treat them with supportive care. Now, there is one condition which you might confuse with ARDS. It's called pulmonary contusion. Do you guys know what that is? pulmonary contusion. So this is when I basically think of it as the lung gets bruised, okay? Usually there's some history of trauma and that can cause leakage of fluid into the alveoli as well. The key differentiating factor between ARDS and pulmonary contusion is that in contusion, the damage is going to happen more immediately, okay? So within 24 hours of the initial insult. ARDS takes time to develop. Again, think of our case The man got pancreatitis, and then 48 hours later, he went into ARDS. Another factor about pulmonary contusion is that it may be unilateral, so it depends on the type of injury. 
And then the chest x-ray finding is going to look similar. You'll see that diffuse alveolar infiltrate, but this time you can distinguish the two based on the history. Now that pretty much wraps up ARDS and NRDS, okay? Just to give you guys a quick recap, remember that both of these diseases are going to be associated with ground glass opacities on chest x-ray. It may be described as a diffuse alveolar infiltrate. They might show you a picture that just looks like a bilateral whiteout. What was the cause of NRDS? Decreased surfactant. And the ground glass opacities were from what? The collapse of the alveoli, so the bilateral atelectasis. And then how did we say we can prevent NRDS? So we can give maternal corticosteroids before birth to try and maximize uh, production of surfactant. And then how do we treat NRDS? Right, we can use exogenous surfactant, we can use mechanical ventilation, and there was one condition that we didn't want to confuse NRDS with. What was that? Transient tachypnea of the newborn. Remember, this would have similar physical findings, but the chest x-ray would show perihilar streaking rather than the alveolar infiltrate. Now, ARDS. What was the cause of ARDS? So any alveolar insult, sepsis, pancreatitis, trauma, some other kind of infection, what were the ground glass opacities from? From fluid leaking into the alveoli because of increased capillary permeability. Now, how do we differentiate ARDS from cardiogenic edema? Remember that ARDS has normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. How do we treat ARDS? Supportive. We use mechanical ventilation and oxygen. And we don't want to confuse ARDS with what disease? Pulmonary contusion, right? Think of that as bruising of the lungs. And remember, that'll have an earlier onset of symptoms within 24 hours. ARDS will be later. Congratulations if you survived that little rapid fire recap. Um, I didn't want that to be intimidating. I just wanted to kind of review the important points that I wanted you to take away from this review. I can tell you from my personal experience, the hardest part for me with ARDS and NRDS was always identifying that that was the disease process going on in the vignette. And so that's why I tried to break down the question vignettes that we described in this episode and explain all of the findings. So hopefully now it'll be easier for you to identify these in the question stems, and hopefully we've built up a better understanding of that pathophysiology so that you can answer those second and third order questions, okay? If you're still listening, thank you so much for taking the time to listen. If you thought this review was helpful, please subscribe to our podcast and tune in to more reviews just like this. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please visit our website at spoonfulofsugar.org and you can post them under this episode. I know studying can get really difficult uh, and it can get really frustrating at times. So whatever it is you're doing, I wish you good luck. Keep on trooping. We'll be with you with a brand new episode soon. But in the meantime, just remember that SOS doesn't just have to stand for a cry for help. It can also stand for a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down. Thank you, guys.